All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President here at the Atlanta Council. Welcome to our conversation on stopping Kremlin aggression in the Sea of Azov. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Council for what I think is going to be an important conversation today on the recent events in the Sea of Azov and how Ukraine and its Western allies can respond. As everybody here in this room knows, as those watching online on TV know, on November 25th, Russian forces opened fire and seized three Ukrainian naval ships attempting to travel from the Black Sea to the Sea of Azov, waters that Russia and Ukraine legally share. Six Ukrainian crew members were injured, and all 24 of them were detained and are still in Russian custody. This attack marks a significant escalation in Russia's war against Ukraine. It is the first time the Kremlin has overtly used its armed forces against Ukraine, Several Western countries, the European Union and NATO, have condemned the Kremlin's aggression against Ukraine, but a comprehensive response has yes, yet to take shape. We're gathering at a pretty important time on the hills, heels of a NATO foreign ministerial discussion in Brussels on some of this issue, but we also gather when there is a time of intense debate here in Washington. There's a current debate happening inside the executive branch up on Capitol Hill about these events, about our response. And our intention today is to help inform that conversation and to shape these decisions. Our panelists will surely touch on a, a, a response must, be, must take shape soon if Russia's government is going to take this seriously. Many of the experts you'll hear from today and many others in the Atlanta Council family have been out there arguing that the West does not display willingness to take concrete steps in response to the attacks against Ukraine. The Kremlin will view this as an indication that it can continue unhindered. In essence, what we have to understand is unfolding right now before our eyes is yet another example of creeping annexation, this time in the territorial waters of Ukraine. Importantly, this is not an isolated incident. It's part of a pattern. It's part of what's happened over years. And Ukraine is not the only state that faces this threat from its neighbor, Georgia and the Republic of Moldova, have already had some of their territory occupied by the Kremlin's aggression. Now all of these states in the region are working to be recognized as countries on the front line of freedom. This is where that dividing line is, as they struggle to have a future that is where they can be free, whole, and secure European states. So we at the Council have been proud to be partners in supporting them in this mission, and we'll continue to do what we can to help these countries maintain their freedom, determine their own destiny, and ensure their sovereignty. This conversation today I'm very much looking forward to with a terrific set of experts. I'm really delighted to welcome back to the Atlantic Council uh, one of my personal heroes. We'll hear from General Phil Breedlove, former uh, uh, Atlantic Council Board Director, uh, former Supreme Allied Commander. Thank you for being with us today. We're looking forward uh, to your thoughts. His leadership was so instrumental in office. Uh, his voice remains so important uh, after your service. Uh, 
His remarks will be preceded by a discussion among some remarkable experts on these issues. We'll turn to our own Ambassador Dan Fried, former Ambassador to Poland and Assistant Secretary uh, for Europe, who's a distinguished fellow here. Ambassador John Herbst, former Ambassador to Ukraine, who manages uh, the Atlantic Council's Eurasia program and its Ukraine efforts. Uh, Dr. Celeste Wallander, a great friend and colleague uh, who served at the highest levels of the White House handling Russia policy in the previous administration, is now President and CEO of the U.S. Russia Foundation, and of course, Ambassador Alexander Verschbau, former Ambassador to Russia, Deputy Secretary uh, General of NATO, among many others. And running this show today is the one of our, our very own Melinda Herring, who's an editor extraordinaire who leads the wildly successful Ukraine Alert blog. So I hope you all enjoy this conversation. We're looking forward to not only the specific ideas and recommendations that the team has. This is not a tactical response that requires short-term tactical replies. This is part of uh, uh, something that's, again, a reminder of in the absence of a comprehensive strategy to deal with a revanchist Kremlin, we will be gathering again and again for comparable conversations. So how do we write that ship? Let me turn it over to Melinda to steward the show. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Melinda Herring, and I'm delighted to be here with four of, I think, the top experts in the United States to discuss this uh, very timely crisis. Uh, the way that we're going to use our time today is our four experts will give opening statements. We'll have 35 minutes of a discussion, and then we will kick it over to you to ask questions. So please start thinking of questions now. Uh, but right now, it's my pleasure to give the stage to Dr. Celeste Wallander. Thank you very much. Thank you to Damon, to the whole Atlantic Council team for inviting me. It's a privilege to be here. Um, but as Damon pointed out, it's also disconcerting to once again be here um, addressing these issues, but it's our responsibility and it is important to be thinking uh, in the moment, but also thinking ahead. And so I have three main points to make, I think, uh, what, I, what I think Russian strategy is that we should understand. Um, number one is that I agree with Damon's characterization that this is a revanchist Russia, but as importantly, I think it's important to understand that it's a revisionist Russia. And in addition to the specific goals with respect to Ukraine, uh, can, uh, influence over Kyiv, uh, trying to keep the Ukrainian leadership uh, on its back heels, insecure, vulnerable, uh, and amenable to uh, Russian pref or at least Kremlin preferences. Um, this is also about challenging the rules, the international rules of the game, mm -hmm. and trying to change the uh, international law, international practice in ways that favors Kremlin tactics and Kremlin interests. So that's issue number one, and I'll come back to that and explain what I mean. Number two is that this is another instance, and when we, we keep being surprised by it, because what we should take away from this is ru this Russian actions are outrageous, but they're completely predictable. Mm -hmm. This is another instance of Russian uh, boil the frog, as my friend Victoria Newland liked to characterize it during our, our time in the Obama administration, or another you know kind of old, more classic context is salami tactics. The Russians are extremely good at small steps, and even though this was an escalation, in the grand scheme of things, it was a small step to change the status quo and to force the international community to, to accept and recognize, even through um, sort of uh, not voicing complaints, um, a change status quo that fits better Kremlin tactics. And third, the third point is that we need to be thinking what comes next. We need to stop being so responsive to these salami tactics, this boil the frog um, activity. That's going to continue. But because the Russian actions are, in a sense, so predictable, we can get ahead of the curve and we can think down the road and um, be, re be better prepared and with deterrence um, capabilities and not just military and not even mostly military capabilities, uh, but political and economic tools that we have advantages in. So number one, changing the revisionist changing of the rules. What do I mean by that? In Georgia, after the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008, the world attention went away after the fall of 2008. But the game wasn't over at that point. Because in addition to declaring the independence and recognizing the independence of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, the Russian uh, military and border guards that were supposedly there cooperating with those two uh, entities that the international community didn't recognize, but Russia did, 
began to slowly but surely move the wire lines forward and create a new reality on the ground day by day. So that one little move wasn't going to necessarily get the attention of capitals. But you turn around a month later, and suddenly the border is a couple of kilometers further in away from the uh, territorial uh, lines, the, the regional lines between Abkhazia and South Ossetia, to the point now where South Ossetia and Abkhazia are considerably larger than they were in 2008. And this isn't in the headlines. So this is what we mean by the Russian boil the frog and salami tactics. This is what they do constantly. And the international community, by not calling it out constantly and repeatedly, becomes accommodated to it. And in effect, through its actions and lack of reactions and calling it out, comes to accept it. Another example of this, and there are many, but I'll give you another one because you may be have paid attention to the Ukrainian ones, but you may have forgotten about the Georgian ones. The Russians claimed un under the Open Skies Treaty, um, treaty members cannot conduct Open Skies flights within 10 kilometers of non-treaty party members. So the, when the United States and Europe would file flight plans for the Open Skies Treaty under our rights under the treaty, the Russians would deny flight plans that approached within 10 kilometers of South Ossetia and Abkhazia because those were independent countries that were not members of, were not treaty parties to the Open Skies Treaty. The United States would protest. Um, no one wanted to have a military conflict um, so that we wouldn't necessarily um, execute those flight plans, and you couldn't because the Russians had denied them. But by, over time, denying those flights, Russia laid the basis then for claiming that through their actions, the United States and Europe were, in effect, recognizing the sovereignty and territorial integrity of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Why do I belabor this? Um, because I think everyone here is familiar what it, with what has happened in the Sea of Azov, but I want to put a different frame on it for you. It's not just about assaulting Ukrainian ships. It's not just about um, asserting uh, control of the Kerch Strait. It's by, the, it's by asserting and laying the groundwork for the next step, which is claiming territorial sovereignty, in this case, naval territorial sovereignty, over the Sea of Azov. The first step was this, was over the summer when uh, Russian ships began to claim the right to stop, question, and even inspect commercial ships in the Sea of Azov. Um, and this latest act in uh, preventing the egress, the, the, the uh, shipping of uh, Ukrainian naval ships, military naval ships into the Sea of Azov is the next step in that boil the frog policy that Russia has been so effective at executing in Georgia, in Moldova, and also, as we've seen, in Ukraine since 2014. So the takeaway from that, for me, comes back to my other point about don't just think about territory. Think about the rules of the game. And think about the response having to be relying upon the international community, which itself actually may not, not every member of the international community may care about Ukraine. I'm sorry to say that for all our Ukrainian friends in the room. But they do care about the international rules of the game, because those international rules of the game protect us all. And that's where a big part of our effort should be. And it was where a large part of the Obama administration's response to the Russian invasion of first Crimea and then the Donbass in 2014 was, not simply because the Obama administration is a big friend of international <laughs> law, um, but because that was an effective argument to make to the broader international community. And so that's where part of the response needs to be. Finally, what's coming next? What's coming next is um, predictable in the sense that the, the Sea of Azov is the immediate, uh, is the immediate objective. Um, but I want to highlight two political object, a, a political objective and a military objective that we need to pay attention to. Number one is the Ukrainian presidential election. The goal, I think, of the Kremlin is to get a Kremlin-friendly leadership in Kiev one way or another. And one way of doing that is by creating instability, fear, and uncertainty in an atmosphere where it's not clear whether there could be further Russian military operations. And that, I think there is a moment of high danger in the next couple of months of inexplicable escalation in the sea or on the ground. Not necessarily a clear military objective, 
but a political objective of shaking, shaking the, the status quo, or shaking the, the fears and the concerns and the intentions of the Ukrainian political elite and, and economic elite ahead of that election. The second um, political aspect of this to point to is not the Ukrainian election, but the prospect of an American election in 2020. And I fear that beyond the immediate time frame of May 2019, the other time frame that the Kremlin has in mind is the next American <coughs> political cycle in 2020 and the need to act decisively before there might be a political change in the United States and before there might be a consolidation of political leadership in Europe, in particular in Germany. And so we are possibly entering a period akin to 2014 where the Kremlin believes it has the opportunity of a distracted uh, and disunified transatlantic uh, relationship to get away with these salami tactics, these boil the frog steps, to change what the status quo looks like while we're not effective in being united and paying attention. But we can, we can address that by being effective and united and paying attention, and it's within our power. And more than any particular military response, that's what I would advocate our, we need to spend, be spending more focus on. Thank you so much. Ambassador Virchbaugh? Thanks very much, and thanks for the chance to be on this very distinguished panel. Uh, I'm, I was asked to give the view from NATO, so I will uh, approach it from that perspective. Uh, I would say at the outset, allies do seem to be uh, pretty much in agreement that Russia is responsible for what happened on November 25th, and they are certainly unanimous that irrespective of your views as to the sequence of events and what happened, uh, Russia had no legal justification or political justification for the use of force. Uh, but that being said, I, I'm still not convinced that allies fully appreciate the stakes uh, of this whole episode. Uh, now, the day after the incident, Secretary General Stolten Stoltenberg, you know, following the usual playbook, convened the NATO-Ukraine Commission at ambassadorial level, which still is allowed to meet despite the Hungarian blockage at higher level meetings. Uh, and the next day, the, uh, the North Atlantic Council issued a carefully worded statement uh, calling for the return of the Ukrainian ships and sailors without delay uh, and for restoration of freedom of navigation and unhindered access to Ukrainian ports. And of course, the uh, Allies reaffirmed their support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, while at the same time urging common restraint on both sides. And indeed, since then, uh, the NATO response, uh, like the US response, uh, in my view, has lacked any real sense of urgency. Uh, most European leaders have issued fairly limp expressions of concern. Sometimes it's serious concern, sometimes it's deep concern, but <laughs> concern is not an answer. Uh, but conspicuously absent in all of this has been any specificity regarding the consequences for Russia of its direct aggression uh, and its illegal use of force against Ukrainian ships. Nor was it clear what anyone uh, would do if Putin drags his feet or outright refuses to return the ships and the sailors to Ukraine. Uh, yesterday's NATO foreign ministers meeting didn't uh, change the picture very much. There was more rhetorical criticism and talk of raising the costs for Russia, but no concrete steps were announced on sanctions, nor was there anything significant on additional NATO support for Ukraine. Secretary General Stoltenberg said NATO had already increased its presence in the Black Sea, which is true. Uh, it was apparently about 120 days during which NATO ships were in the Black Sea this year compared to 80 days last year. But this implied that there was little scope for, for more robust uh, NATO action. And there was still no or else uh, to the warnings about Russia's uh, need to, to return uh, the ships and the sailors. Now, NATO's position may evolve over the next few days, uh, and perhaps there'll be consider consideration of tougher measures. But right now, I regret to say that uh, President Putin sees hesitation rather than resolve uh, from Washington and from Brussels. And I think this is disturbing because we need to all remember, uh, as Celeste has already mentioned, that the November 25 attacks were not a one-off one event or an isolated occurrence. Uh, Russia has been incrementally increasing the pressure on Ukraine for several months, reminiscent of what it did in Georgia in the spring and summer of 2008. Uh, Putin is testing the West in the hope that each single step, each, each increase in the temperature under that boiling frog, 
will be met with only verbal protests. And so far, he's been right. Now, in this case, uh, it's also clear that Moscow has been preparing the ground to kind of lay a trap for Ukraine and to teach Poroshenko a lesson. Uh, and I have in mind the fact that the MFA, uh, the, the Russian Foreign Ministry, unilaterally changed the status of the Kerch Strait to Russian sovereign territory in a little noticed uh, MFA declaration on the 15th of November. So in, in the Russian view, this is a unilateral view, but it's still their view, that uh, the Kerch Strait is, is no longer a shared body of water, even if the Sea of Azov remains uh, such under the 2003 agreement. Now, while the Ukrainians have been careful and wise to avoid uh, escalation, uh, Putin may believe that the United States and the West will increasingly buy his claim of a Ukrainian provocation, or at least accept the notion that both sides uh, bear equal responsibility, uh, uh, rather than imposing any real costs on Moscow. So I'm of the view that indecision by the US and its allies is only going to embolden Putin as we enter a, period, enter a period of heightened danger in the lead up to Ukraine's elections uh, at the end of March. Uh, as Celeste said, Putin clearly intends to do all he can to destabilize Ukraine between now and the elections to show that it's an ungovernable failed state with leaders who are provoking Russia in order to distract attention from their failures at home. And all this is in the hope of uh, bringing to power leaders who may be more pliable, more willing to show deference uh, to Moscow. So Ukraine has to navigate uh, carefully, both politically and in, the, in its conduct on the seas, while doing everything it can to defend itself uh, against Russian hybrid warfare. And hopefully martial law will be used to strengthen readiness and resilience and not as a tool for uh, gaining electoral advantage. But beyond their own efforts, the Ukrainians need and deserve more backing from the US and its allies if we hope to deter new Russian aggression, whether it's uh, new offensives in the Donbas or uh, in some new strategic direction, such as the seizure of uh, Mariupol or Berdyansk, the uh, Ukrainian ports on the Sea of Azov. I'm worried that if, uh, as rumors have it, the Kerch Bridge is not very well built and could even collapse, uh, the Russians will blame Ukrainian ter terrorists, so-called, who supposedly were aboard the two Ukrainian ships uh, that were seized and then use this as a pretext for establishing the, uh, the long-awaited land bridge to Crimea. So there, the stakes are high and we need to pay attention, as Celeste said. Uh, we and the Europeans should develop a package of targeted sanctions uh, to be imposed if Russia doesn't return the ships and sailors uh, before Christmas, say, give them a deadline, perhaps focusing on uh, Russian shipping, Russian banks that aren't yet covered by existing Ukraine sanctions. I'll leave it to Dan to give a more authoritative view on sanctions. Uh, but I would argue that to show the Russians we, we mean business, we need to try yet again to persuade the Germans to suspend or freeze the Nord Stream 2 project uh, for at least a year, maybe longer, to leverage a return to uh, free navigation in the Black and Azov Seas for the Ukrainians, <coughs> and to leverage a more serious Russian approach to the Minsk process. Uh, Certainly a voluntary freeze would be better than having to sanction the, the companies involved in Nord Stream 2. Uh, and it would, uh, I think, pick up on growing doubts within the CDU uh, about the wisdom of the Nord Stream 2 project. The US should work with willing, like-minded allies. I don't think NATO as a whole is going to do this, but we can work with like-minded allies to put together a new package of defense assistance to Ukraine with priority to coastal defense uh, systems like Harpoon that could deter aggression against Mariupol and Berdyansk, uh, uh, as well as providing improved radars and other surveillance assets uh, to the Ukrainian Navy. The U.S. seems to be putting a great emphasis on the need for other allies to step up since Ukraine is in their backyard. Uh, burden sharing is, uh, is a perfectly legitimate subject in this area, but I hope it's not being advanced as an excuse for I U.S. inaction over the next few weeks. NATO should try to find ways to increase its Black Sea presence even further and consider more exercises in the region with uh, participation of Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, we should engage with Turkey, Romania, and Bulgaria, the, the three NATO allies who are littoral states, on overcoming their resistance uh, to a formal NATO Black Sea task force or, or Black Sea flotilla. 
Uh, we might talk with Ankara about uh, restricting Russian free passage through the Turkish Straits if Russia continues to behave aggressively and obstruct Ukrainian access to the Azov Sea. Uh, just discussing the subject could give the Russians uh, something to think about. So NATO, I think, is uh, still figuring out what to do and is not entirely uh, comprehending the stakes involved. But I think there are a lot of things that NATO could do in tandem with the United States, and we need good old-fashioned U.S. leadership to take them there. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sandy. Ambassador Freed? Um, this reminds me of the deputies committees that Celeste and I used to attend, where I would often speak at the end and everybody would turn to me and say, okay, so what are we going to do about it? And which sanctions will we impose? Um, sanctions are not the tool you know, for all purposes, but they have become the tool of choice for responding to Russia's aggression against Ukraine. So I'll accept that um, challenge and, and try to come up with some guidelines and specific suggestions. Um, in sanctions, generally, two rules apply. One, you have to know what you want to achieve through sanctions. And two, you have to mean it. Mm -hmm. Sanctions are not fun. They are not cost free. They will hurt companies, countries, and then they will, those countries and companies will lobby against the sanctions. So you'd better make sure you've weighed the balance of risk and benefit and are coming out on the right side. And once you do that, you have to defend your ground. Um, what we want, three things, we want to respond to this latest act of Russian aggression, both military aggression, but also, as Sandy pointed out, the Russian change of territory by seizing the Kerch Straits, changing territorial boundaries unilaterally. Second, we want to not only respond, but to prepare additional responses, both of which may have the effect of deterring Russia from future aggression, which, as both Celeste and Sandy and earlier Damon pointed out, may be the next shoe to drop. Let's not assume that this is the end. Yeah. The Russians may, a la Lenin, you know, dictum with the bayonet, if you thrust the bayonet in an encounter, no resistance, keep thrusting until you encounter steel. Then, but only then, do you pull back. We need to respond and be seen as preparing additional responses. Third, our overall strategic objective in the sanctions is not simply to restore the status quo to the Sea of Azov. Mm -hmm. The purpose is to settle the Donbass, get the Russians out of the Donbass along the lines of Minsk, and to settle Crimea, having it ultimately restored to Ukrainian sovereignty. That will be a longer term process. But sanctions are not a light switch. To tie sanctions to, for example, return of the sailors means that you're tur you risk turning them on and off with Russian action. If we impose sanctions, we ought to keep them on until there is a general settlement along the lines I described. Um, all right, so, so here's my menu. First, enforce the Crimea sanctions that already exist. The U.S. administration could do a better job, though to be fair, they have done a they have sanctioned additional Crimean entities. We ought to do more, and the Europeans need to do much more. The European Union already has in place sanctions against Crimea. They need to enforce them. The purpose is to turn Crimea into a very expensive liability and not simply a prized possession that Putin can parade around and hold torchlights parades in. Um, secondly, we need to go beyond just Crimea sanctions, uh, and we need to have it think about and renew our escalatory menu of sanctions. Here are some ideas. First of all, in the financial area, ba a ban on new Russian sovereign debt. Okay, this is uh, Secretary Minu Treasury Secretary Mnuchin said that this is recent, a few months ago, that this is a step too far. Um, my own. Um, conversations with experts who know more about financial markets than I do uh, suggest that this isn't the case. This is a tough step, 
uh, it would rattle Russian markets, we ought to take it. Uh, secondly, consider, and I would say go for, no new debt financing applied to all Russian state enterprises. Now that's not quite as drastic as the word sound because we have already applied restrictions on debt financing to the big Russian state, state banks. Nevertheless, this would be a significant additional step. Third, if you're going to go after a single Russian bank, a large one, don't do spare bank, don't do VTB, that would uh, blow back on Western financial markets. Try VEB. All right, that's the Russian Economic Development Agency, more or less. We could apply full blo treasury blocking sanctions to them. Um, there's more escalatory headroom in the financial area, but this is enough for now. In energy, there is less headroom. In the Obama administration, the Trump administration has followed this. We decided to go after current, sorry, future rather than current oil production and not touch gas. I would maintain these guidelines, but I would increase pressure on Russian future oil production. That means broadening the technology restrictions. Now that's easier said than done because the Russians have their own technology and some of the technology they can get from China, but it is not a null set. Western firms collectively still have a monopoly on some of the technology the Russians need to squeeze the oil out of certain of their projects. That would hurt American and some European companies. And we have to be prepared for that. I would go, I would look at this seriously anyway on the grounds that four years after the cr Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, um, that's enough time for companies to factor in the risk factor, you know, factor in proper risk. Um, finally, and I would take this step regardless of Ukraine, we ought to be doing it anyway. We ought to be going after uh, Putin's more Putin corrupt cronies. And simultaneously, we should be drying up the occult channels through which these cronies send their monies. In other words, start to close the channels for Russian investment into using LLCs and various hidden methods into the Miami, New York, and London real estate markets, and do it with the EU so the, the money simply doesn't flow to additional markets. We know that Putin hates sanctions against himself and against his buddies. We know this because of the lengths to, Put to which Putin went to try to get the Magnitsky Act overturned. And we know, thanks to the Panama Papers, that the Magnitsky Act affected some of, some of Putin's assets. So like, we know what hurts because they complained. The Russian cries of anger should be an indication of leverage. They show no hesitation making war on their neighbor and annexing territory, we should go after them. And this is not simply retaliation, this is good government. This is anti-corruption. Um, with respect to Nord Stream 2, well, I've never liked it, I still don't like it, but I would, going after German companies would not be my first choice, because I would rather have the Germans alongside us in all the other measures I mentioned above rather than get into a fight with the Germans. I think Sandy's right. The Germans ought to themselves suspend Nord Stream 2. And here's an argument for the Germans. <coughs> the Russians made war, at, well, uh, military aggression and annexation of, terror of the Kerch Straits in order, arguably, to protect their infrastructure investment of the Kerch Strait Bridge. Once they have a completed uh, important pipeline in the Baltic Sea, what might they do with that? It's just something to think about. I think the Germans should reconsider the balance of interests. And I would, it would be great if they would suspend Nord Stream 2 pending a resolution of Russia's aggression into Ukraine. Again, I don't think the time is right to deliberately target German companies uh, for Nord Stream 2, much as I don't like Nord Stream 2, because I think we have other things we want the Germans to do. Final point is, we ought to be doing all of these things with Europe. Mm. And, the, and if the message to Putin is 
The Europeans have now woken up and have agreed to um, significant sanctions against you. It, it may suggest to Russians that Putin was not right in his calculation of the Western response to his aggra latest aggression against Ukraine. We want to show that Putin has misjudged us. He, has reg he regards us as weak, malleable, and accepting of his aggression. It is in our interests to prove him wrong. Um, and I wouldn't, and if it is important to get the Europeans on side, I wouldn't start by insulting the European Union. Okay, <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, and since, our, since the Secretary of State criticized so-called Brussels bureaucrats yesterday in a speech in Brussels, I would point out that in my experience, the Brussels bureaucrats, uh, AKA the European Commission, were the people responsible for setting up the successful joint imposition of sanctions by the United States and the European Union. The, count, the European Council, the member states, couldn't have done it without the staff work by the European Commission. Bureaucrats in the service of strategic advance have their place. So, thank you. Thank you very much. We were expecting nothing less. Ambassador Herbst, your turn. Okay, uh, the unfortunate position of being last and virtually everything that needs to be said has been said. So I, I will offer a few main points and then some small additional, I hope, insights. First of all, to, to frame this issue, it goes back to what Celeste said, that the Kremlin is pursuing a revisionist policy designed to upend the rules of order established, certainly at the end of the Cold War, but even at the end of World War II. Concepts like sovereignty and territorial integrity in Moscow's mind does not apply to its neighbors and does not apply to any country which has a sizable number of ethnic Russians, or for that matter, Russian speakers. So the way to understand the stakes of what's happening in eastern Ukraine is that uh, if Moscow succeeds um, in upending the territorial integrity of Ukraine, the chance of Moscow provoking the Baltic states goes way up because 25% of the population in Estonia and Latvia are Russian, and there are more Russian speakers beyond that. So the, the smartest, the safest way to defend our Baltic allies is to make sure that Moscow gets bogged down in Don Donbass until it decides to leave. And that does not involve American troops, NATO troops. Two, if you look at the crisis that's happening right now, why did it happen on November 25? Uh, the first thing to understand is that Moscow began a new part of its hybrid campaign against Ukraine in April when it began to inspect ships coming to and from the Ukrainian ports of Berdyansk and Mariupol. Donbass, is, while it's a site of war, it remains an important economic area for Ukraine. As a result of the inspections, the delays in shipping, imports and exports from Ukrainian ports in Sea of Azov have dropped, according to statistics that are readily available, 50%. According to some firms that are dealing heavily there, they told me in Kiev last week, 66%. Either way, that's a major hit to Ukraine's economy. Also, for those of you who remember that Moscow launched its war in Ukraine, allegedly for the welfare of Russians and Russian speakers, who are the people who occupy Donbass whose economic livelihood is being threatened by Moscow's heavy-handed tactics in the Sea of Azov? not predominantly, but in proportional terms, a greater number of Russians and ethnic and Russian speakers. So clearly, we know this is a cynical game by the Kremlin to talk about their well-being. Now, it happened on November 25, one, as part of this Russian tightening of the clamp on Donbass. Two, in September, Ukraine sent its naval ships through the Straits of Kerch into the Sea of Azov. The Russians let it happen. My understanding, and I'll leave it at that, is that Mr. Putin, after this happened, though ultimately he did not say no, was not enthusiastic about it and did not want it to happen a second time. So that's the second data point as you look at this. Third data point, which would seem to have nothing to do with this. Ukraine won, or is in the process of winning, a critical victory in its war for true independence on the religious front. You all know that the Constantinople Patriarch, who's the primus inter pares in the Orthodox world, has announced his intention to grant Ukraine autocephaly very soon. This will lead to the creation of a unified Ukrainian Orthodox Church, 
recognized by world orthodoxy, which A, will take a substantial chunk of Moscow Patriarchate churches with it, and two, become the second largest church in the Orthodox world, which will also be a counter to Kremlin influence through the world Orthodox community. Mr. Putin is not amused by this. Next point, Mr. Putin's own domestic problems. You've seen a rash of not particularly well-informed analysis that President Poroshenko declared martial law as a way to deal with his domestic problems. Now, I'm not saying that political calculations did not play at all in his decision, but martial law, when you're a relatively weak country like Ukraine, threatened by the world's second most powerful military, is not a crazy option. It's also an option which Poroshenko was slammed for three and a half, four years for not pursuing. Anyway, well, people were focusing on that, which is very, very, um, very, very positive for Kremlin propagandists. No one was paying attention to the fact that not only has Putin's approval ratings dropped to, for him, the low figures of the 60s, but much more important, and this is going to be, he's been in the 60s before, much more importantly, the Levada Center polls show, actually, the Levada Center polls have showed for a couple of years that a majority of Russians think the country is heading in the wrong directions. But new, this is new information. Different polls from the same center, Moscow's premier polling institution, demonstrate that a majority of Russians are now blaming the president of Russia for that fact. That is a, da that is a dangerous statistic. So Mr. Putin had also domestic reasons for this. Finally, this happened on November 25th because on November 23, Ukrainian naval ships started sailing from Odessa towards the Straits of Kerch, asking to go into the Sea of Azov. Now, the Kremlin has built up its navy in the Sea of Azov. Part of that is to, maintain, is to build that stranglehold on Ukrainian economic activity through the Straits of Kerch, through the Sea of Azov. Also, to position their military for possible additional strikes or to th just to raise the cost of Ukraine's defense by threatening additional strikes from the Sea of Azov. Some people talk about the problem of Crimea's water supply. It's a very serious problem. And that shaky bridge that Sandy referred to. And let's remember that Hitler's great architect and engineer, Speer, could not build a bridge across the Straits of Kerch. And he tried. He tried. The waters of the Straits are very, very, um, the currents are very strong. Very strong. Which is why the railroad which is supposed to accompany the road bridge is not, not in motion. Anyway, if that bridge is in trouble, the importance of the Sievera Krimsky Canal, which in <coughs> days when, when Ukraine had full control over Crimea, um, supplied water from the Dnipro River to Crimea, becomes very, very important. Now, I personally don't think the Kremlin will try and seize that, because that will require a military operation that even Mogherini could not deny. And they want, to avoid, they want to avoid that type of operation because that will trigger serious sanctions, I think, uh, and other, other actions. But these, all these things had the Kremlin ready to say no to the next time Ukraine was going to send its ships through the Straits of Kerch. Now, so what was the Kremlin trying to do by the way it dealt with these ships? If its goal was the simple one of simply stopping those ships from entering into the sea, they had it solved once they put that tanker, and you've all seen the picture, under the, the bridge that's over the Straits of Kerch. When that tanker's sitting there, the only way those ships could have gotten in would have been by taking forcible action against the tanker. And that obviously would have been just the sort of pretext Moscow would have loved to slam Ukraine in a much harder way than it did with attacking those ships. Okay, so the Ukrainian ships try to pass. What do they, what does the Russians try to do first? To ram the tugboat. What were they trying to do? they were trying to get the Ukrainians to shoot. Because if the Ukrainians shot first, they would claim that Poroshenko had pulled a Saakashvili and they could punch. Didn't work. The Ukrainians did not shoot. And by the way, you've all heard the tapes, because the Ukrainians had the SBU on board, because they expected some sort of antic from the Kremlin, uh, relaying the orders from the commander on the ground to the sailors saying, go after them. And interestingly, uh, not only did they try ramming, when that didn't work, when that didn't produce a Ukrainian reaction, they tried shooting. Ukrainians were probably smart not to shoot back, because that would have given the Kremlin reason to claim, well, look, the Ukrainians are shooting at us, what else can we do but bomb Odessa or whatever it is they were going to plan. So they, they shot, 
and then to make sure that they put a um, what did I say? An eye on the punctuation point. They seize the ships. But here's here's my final point, and this is this is actually the most important point. Once they did that, once the Ukrainians had not responded in a way that the Russians could claim as a pretext, Moscow hunkered down and said, "Hey, we're not doing anything, guys. Restrain those crazy Ukrainians." Why did they do that? Because they wanted to make sure that the West remained asleep. And this comes back to Celeste's point about Russia as a revisionist power. I shouldn't say Russia, Putin as a revisionist leader. Their aim is to take as much as they can without provoking the West. For those who say the need for strong response is warlike, is provocative, should understand that we've tried 10 years of appeasement. We tried it after Georgia. We got Crimea. We tried it after Crimea. We got Donbass. Now, point of fact, we didn't, have, we didn't really have appeasement after Donbass, thanks in part to Celeste and Dan. Uh, what we did with sanctions was real. Although, remember, 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 Donbass began as an operation in what? April of 14. The hard sanctions only came in July, three months later. So we're now only 10 days after this lovely incident in the Black Sea. Uh, the Europeans didn't even take the sanctions until after the shoot down of the Malaysian airliner. So, you know, we need a little bit of encouragement. Uh, Sandy outlined the full range of measures with Dan going into depth on sanctions. Those are the right ones. I don't need to repeat them. I suspect that over time, and by over time, I mean four, six, eight weeks, we will see the U.S. somehow move forward to take some of those steps. This uh, progression is um, slowed down a little bit by our, the point in time we are at, the fact that we have a lame duck Congress. Uh, Congress has been a very important factor in this whole equation, first under the Obama administration, especially under the Trump administration. But eventually, when Congress comes into session, if not before that, we will see a stronger US response, which may then lay the way for the Europeans to join in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Herbst. I'm glad you mentioned the videos. I wanted to ask Dr. Wallander about this. The videos of the clash are pretty underwhelming. If you watch them, there's a lot of cursing and boats <laughs> bumping into each other. Why is the crisis such a big deal? If you just look at the video, it doesn't look like much. Um, Hopefully well, that'll get you going. <laughs> well, mostly, I mean, first of all, any kind of clash, a military clash, is intrinsically dangerous because it, is, it creates the combust, combustible material for an escalation. And you know, uh, rarely do uh, conflicts that escalate to higher levels do so deliberately for many of the reasons that you know, it's, a, it's a game, but it's, a, it's an unpredictable game. Um, so I think that that's why um, that there is reason for concern, um, and it is it is, whereas we've had clashes before um, between Russian forces and other countries' ground forces, this really is extraordinary that it's now been extended to the, the maritime realm. This is new, and it is uh, dangerous and unpredictable because the Black Sea is also a literal sea of several NATO members, yeah. as, as Sandy pointed out. But I think the reason I, I would come back to why it is combustible is that it's politically combustible. Mm -hmm. It's the willingness of this Kremlin, again, to use military instruments, not an invasion, but military instruments for political purposes. And that is uh, a big change from the Russia we were dealing with earlier, uh, a difficult Russia under the first two terms of, of Putin's presidency, where it was willing to use military force inside of Russia. Mm -hmm. Um, different from the chaos immediately after the Soviet U Union broke apart when the Yeltsin pr presidential leadership was willing to use military force in Moldova to prevent being you know, expelled. But to use military force not just for grabbing territory, but to change the political rules of the game, I think, is, is broader and more dangerous for the reasons I would agree with, with my colleagues as, as pointing out. So. Um, it makes it politically and militarily unpredictable in ways that uh, a more capable and more assertive Russia is now has demonstrated is willing to entertain. 
Thanks very much. Ambassador Vershbaugh, uh, you just wrote in the Washington Post that NATO should expand its presence in the Black Sea. What about the Sea of Azov? Some have argued, including Stephen Blank, that NATO should put armed boats in the Sea of Azov at the invitation of the Ukrainian government. Is this legal and is it wise? I think uh, the fundamental problem is it isn't legal. Uh, under the bilateral agreement of 2003, sad to say, Russia gets to clear on any requests by third countries to pass through the Kerch Straits and into the Sea of Azov. Appar apparently, there are also uh, serious operational constraints because it's a very s shallow body of water than you know, very few, if any, American naval vessels and probably allied naval vessels could actually go in there and operate. Uh, would it be a wise move? That's more debatable, but I think, uh, the, given that it's, it's only a theoretical possibility, I think the focus should be on beefing up NATO presence in the Black Sea, you know, not letting that become an uh, uncontested uh, Russian lake, uh, and showing the Russians that if they're you know, worried about encroachment of uh, NATO towards their frontiers, that they're actually you know, triggering this rather than preventing it through their uh, aggressive behavior. Uh, that may not be enough, but, but I think it would be at least a step for NATO to show a little bit more backbone than it's been showing in the last few months. Great, thank you. Ambassador Fried, the leading candidate to replace uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has suggested that the EU and the United States ban Russian ships until the situation is resolved. What do you think about that proposal? I'll take a look at any reasonable proposal. Um, banning Russian shipping <coughs> could it's important in sanctions to think through the collateral damage mm -hmm. <clears throat> and whether the balance of pain is going to be, well, you know, the way you want it to be. So that's one that I would take a look at. Um, and if any German politician is calling for more sanctions, I want to listen most attentively <laughs> and as sympathetically as possible. Um, but I don't want to go into a, a hypothetical because there are a lot of sanctions ideas out there and you want to make sure you can do it, mm -hmm. that it's not going to have unforeseen consequences and that it'll actually hurt the people you want to hurt. Okay, so a bit more time to look into it. Ambassador yeah. Herbst, here's one for you. This is the Buchanan Challenge. Uh, why are we letting ourselves get dragged into everyone's quarrels from the South China Sea to Transnistria to Abkhazia? Do Americans really care about these far-flung places? Should we be willing to risk war with Russia or China over them? Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think this is a glib answer, but I'll start with glib. Um, I believe it was Neville Chamberlain who said something very similar about Czechoslovakia and the British people. And while, let's, let's, be, let's understand, Putin is no Hitler in terms of his, the danger he represents or the um, evil that he represents. He nonetheless is a challenge of a similar kind. He is challenging the rules of the international order. Mm -hmm. uh, let's remember that on the, at the first NATO summit following Russian aggression in, in Ukraine, the one in Wales. The day that summit ended, the Kremlin uh, kidnapped a counterintelligence officer from Estonia. Mm -hmm. uh, what they were saying when they did that was that you and the Baltics are not safe, NATO's not going to protect you. Now, I'm not predicting that Moscow is about to send its tanks into Latvia or Estonia, but I'm not ruling out Russian bad behavior there designed to destabilize things to the eventual detriment of NATO. If you recognize that, and if you recognize our Article 5 commitment mm -hmm. to those allies, and if you recognize how important NATO is to both the security of the United States and the prosperity mm -hmm. of the United States, you don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. And the place to stop them, with that, where we have no commitment to put our soldiers in harm's way, is in Donbass. And the point is, and this is where Buchanan doesn't get it, uh, Ukraine is able to win this war as long as the West provides a support that is easy for the West to provide, meaning weapons, meaning a na increased naval presence in, term in areas where Moscow has to worry about its defense, and of course in terms of sanctions. That's why. And of course the South China Sea, give me a break. Uh, China is the rising competitor for the United States. Yeah. Yeah. The South China Sea is uh, is a host to, I don't know what percentage, but it's a very large percentage of critical world trade. Yeah. If we let the Chinese dominate the South China Sea, we give them a stranglehold over world trade, and why would we do that? Especially since it's wrong.
We would not have published that article. Let, let's just put it that way. Uh, Celeste, let me go back to you. Uh, Ambassador Stephen Pfeiffer just wrote an article uh, for Brookings. You know, he said that round one in this conflict goes to Russia in the crisis. Do you agree with that assessment? Did Russia come out on top? Well, uh, it's not round one. <laughs> I, I haven't thought about which round it is, but it's, n it's not round one. It's, it's uh, not a new start. It's, it's a continuation of this effort to destabilize and continue to influence Ukraine for sure, uh, gain some uh, tactical advantages in, certainly military advantages now in occupying Crimea is a huge military advantage. Uh, to the Russian uh, Ministry of Defense, but also this political agenda of changing the rules of the game, especially the advancing in practical terms the aspiration to you know privileged sphere of influence that they've been arguing for for a decade. So whatever round it is, um, y are they winning? Uh, y yes, they're they tactically won another step as they tactically won, won, won Crimea. Um, the tactical win in Crimea, though, had a tactical disadvantage, for example, in that even though the sanctions, it took long, uh, more time than Ambassador Herbst would have liked for the sanctions to be imposed in the Donbass, uh, making the argument, uh, Ambassador Freed making the argument by referencing the fact that the invasion of the Donbass was ongoing was easier to make based on showing what had happened in Crimea. So you can turn their tactical advantage in gaining something against them mm -hmm. if you're smart. And I think that uh, I would, for example, I'd be very careful. I'm with, Ambassador, uh, with Dan on c caution about Nord Stream. Um, one of the reasons we were successful in 2014 in getting a serious package of sanctions from the, from the Europeans by the end of the summer was that uh, there was a give and take on European businesses were hurt, but American businesses were hurt. So if you're going to expect the Europeans to hurt those economic interests that are going to be advantaged by Nord Stream, you're going to have to put on the table sanctions that are going to hurt American businesses to show that you're willing to share the pain politically and economically. Um, so being able to do that over the long run is really crucial because the key to not it, the key to surviving a loss in a particular round is to win at the end. And in that, you have to have cooperation with Europe. Effectively, the sanctions don't work if they're only American sanctions in terms of economic and business terms, but also politically, they are every day at risk of being unraveled if they are not um, developed in cooperation when, with Europe. So I think that's my other, my other advocacy here is we can think of all the sanctions that Americans might like. If all those sanctions are things that the Europeans have to suffer and we don't have to take any of the pain, they're going to actually undermine the long-term effectiveness so that we don't keep losing round X <laughs> um, on the way to, to losing uh, the bigger challenge. Thanks very much. Uh, Sandy, question for you and uh, the other two diplomats as well, if they want to jump in. Uh, we know that President Trump canceled his meeting with Vladimir Putin at the G20. Didn't the Obama administration try isolating Russia? Did that policy produce any results? As a diplomat, how do you feel about treating diplomatic engagement as a reward to be bestowed or withheld? Yeah, and I, I generally don't argue, uh, don't agree that uh, diplomatic engagement should be seen as a, as a reward. I mean, there, there are a lot of things we have to talk about with Russia, whether we like it or not. They're a permanent member of the Security Council. They're, they can be the spoiler in many different regional crises around the world. So engagement is, uh, is necessary. And I think in this case, it would have been better for the President of the United States to go to Buenos Aires and you know, give a tough message to Putin and threaten some yeah. concrete uh, count, uh, consequences mm -hmm for what he had just done uh, in, the sea of, in the Black Sea. Problem is we don't have a president who seems capable of uh, reading the riot act to Putin uh, as much as we would wish. So in, in these particular circumstances, maybe the snub and doing it in this half, you know, ham-handed, last-minute way was uh, a way of getting the Russians' attention. But, but, the, but the real way to deal with the Russians is to talk to them, but to talk to them with a position of strength, with your allies with you, presenting a united front. And in that sense, I, I agree we shouldn't uh, go out of our way to come up with sanctions that hurt Europeans more than they hurt American companies. And I think we should try to persuade the Germans. And there seems to be a debate emerging within the, uh, one of the ruling parties that Nord Stream 2 is a political project, that it's uh, counterproductive. The, you know, the main excuse is we're going we're gonna to go out and get guarantees of continued gas transit through Ukraine even after Nord Stream is, uh, is online. I mean, the idea, idea that you could put any confidence in such assurances is, uh, is ridiculous, and all the more so after the last few days' events in the uh, Black Sea. 
Great. I want to ask uh, all the four panelists one uh, big question, and then we're going to turn to our audience. Uh, getting back to the big picture, we seem to be in a cycle of bad to worse with Russia. Are we stuck with perpetually <laughs> deteriorating relations and the threat of conflict between two nuclear powers? Is there any way out of this? Who <clears throat> um, Are you going to reject my question? No, I'm <laughs> going. Well, go, I'm go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to reject the premise of it. Of course, we want better relations with Russia. <clears throat> but to get to that better place, we have to deal with and resist the aggressive Russia we've got. Now, I remember the early 1980s. Reagan was a warmonger. His hardline policy against the Soviet Union was endangering world peace. Well, first you have to show the Soviets that their post-Afghanistan aggression and their general uh, and acute hostility to the West of those years was not going to work. And by the way, in the 1980s, tactically, we thought we were losing every round of the Cold War all the way up till about 1989. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm less interested in tactical rounds than I am the underlying strategic issues. And Putin is playing a bad hand well. Okay, mm. I am not convinced he is as strong as he makes out strutting around. Mm. Um, if we organize ourselves properly, we have all the assets, we have the high ground. But our purpose is not to beat on Russia forever. Our purpose is to have a better relationship with a better Russia, mm. which, is, which I believe is possible. I, I know there's a lot of evidence on the other <laughs> side, but I do believe that it is possible. Don? Uh, I would simply underscore <coughs> that the issue is not good relations with Moscow. The issue is protecting American interests. Mm -hmm. And if they're pursuing malign policies, our first interest is in stopping those malign policies. But let me take issue with the notion that, that Putin is a strategic master. I think he's a strategic loser. Uh, point of fact, Moscow has no vital interest in Ukraine, a Ukraine that wants to look towards the EU. Because re let's remember, this crisis did not begin about NATO-Ukraine. It wasn't even about the EU membership for Ukraine. It was about a stupid trade agreement. Uh, Moscow's great strategic problem lies on its eastern border. And we are natural allies in dealing with the rising China. And I suspect, and I can't tell you when this will happen, it could be four years from now, it could be 15. Moscow will pr decide it does really not want to pay the cost of its fight in Donbass and Ukraine, adjust its policies, and we will wind up working together closely, including with a view towards China. And that's the first one. Yeah, I agree with my colleagues. Uh, I think what's, what's different today compared to the Cold War when we were able to kind of with a little help from Gorbachev, let's all recognize, uh, <laughs> bring about uh, a, a change for the better. We have a Russian president now who actually sees it in his interest to maintain a confrontational relationship with the West. It's a tool of domestic control, uh, explaining away uh, the you know, stagnant economy, declining living standards. Uh, the question is w whether the Russian people are going to put up with that for very long. So we have to contain and manage a competitive relationship so we're not doomed to to be in this kind of downward spiral forever, but we have to steel ourselves for what may be many, many years of, of this kind of strategic competition. But right now, we're not competing as effectively as we should be. I told my four-year-old daughter that she's going to be a Russia specialist, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Dr. Wallander, would so you like to Just to completely agree with my colleagues, and, and but I'll be a little more cynical than Sandy, and even more cynical than Dan, which is always <laughs> fun, um, which is that I, I and it, it comes back to John, John's point, while Russia doesn't have a, uh, a strategic interest in a bad relationship or uh, with, uh, any problem with Ukraine's westward trajectory and really should be worried about a rising China more, um, the Kremlin does. And I, I think it's, I, the thought I want to leave everyone with was you need to distinguish between Russian national interests and Putin regime interests. And the Putin regime does not just use foreign policy for internal political popularity. Uh, but foreign policy feeds the corrupt political economic system within Russia. Um, the Eurasian Economic Union uh, what is about uh, special access to special deals between you know, the guys of the Eurasian, sorry, it is guys. Um, maybe not after the Ukrainian election, we'll see, but for now it's all the guys. Um, and so the, it's, it is personal. And the, the threat that the liberal international order poses to the form of Putinism, of political economic rule within Russia, is real in the minds of the Kremlin. And that's why they're obsessed with color revolutions, regime change. And they, they really saw Ukraine's evolution as a threat to that. 
they were wrong that it wasn't a threat to Russia, I agree with you. But I think we need to take seriously that this is an article of faith and deeply embedded and why we have to deal with the Kremlin we, we face, not mm -hmm. the Kremlin we maybe hoped for. Thank you very much. We have 30 minutes for Q&A. I would love to talk to you for 30 more minutes, but I'm going to bring in our audience. First question here is Danilo with Voice of America's Russia Service, please. Microphone, please. And when you uh, get up, I need your name, your identity, and a question. No statements, please. I will cut you off if you give a speech. Danila, the floor Thank is yours. Thank you very much. Voice of America, Russian service, two questions to Ambassador Herbs. Uh, with all your experience, uh, other panelists say that you were saying that uh, Kremlin wants another uh, power in Ukraine. Because, and just recently, Putin called Poroshenko as a member of party of war. He, he openly stated it yesterday. Do you think it is achievable for Kremlin to get somebody new, somebody other in Ukraine uh, after these elections? And because of what? And if, Celeste, you can, you can think of it too. And second question also to Ambassador Herbst. You know, I had difficulties to, it's, it's maybe technical, maybe not so. Uh, I had difficulties to check on your website like yesterday and before yesterday. And this is usually not the case because your site is brilliant and I use it very much. Was it something specific? Because I've been told that it could be an attack and you've been under attack before. Okay, Thank you. you. Second question first. The Atlantic Council has experienced a high volume of inauthentic traffic targeting of our website generally and our content related to Russia and Ukraine. This ongoing situation is resulting in the website to be only intermittently accessible as we address the issue. We appreciate your patience. Uh, since I arrived at the Atlantic Council, uh, what was it, four and a half years ago, I've gotten special attention from certain services. Uh, regarding your first question, uh, there's no doubt that Moscow's policies are designed to produce a leadership in Ukraine more favorable to Kremlin interests. Um, I don't think they believe they can achieve this in the presidential election, which will happen this spring. But they are hoping this will occur with the RAD elections, which will happen next fall. Uh, Putin has said, not just that you know, the current president of Ukraine represents war, but he's also made statements about the ability to deal with Ukraine um, in a better fashion after the elections with a new leadership. Uh, that could be interpreted, actually, in at least two ways, but perhaps more. On the one, it could be interpreted is if he gets the guy he wants, Ukraine will pursue the policies he wants, and therefore everything will be fine. Uh, that's not going to happen. No matter who wins the presidential elections and how the parties shape up after the Rada elections, Putin will face a dynamic in Ukraine similar, not identical, of course, but similar to what he faces today, which is a largely united political class a largely united people against Kremlin aggression. Because everybody understands that this is a war of the Kremlin against Ukraine. And Putin really is the father of modern Ukrainian patriotism and nationalism, without a doubt. Uh, now, there's a second way to interpret what Putin said. And I'm not going to tell you this is how it would play out. But were I involved in US policy, I would, try, I would test it. This is that, OK, Putin's hoping he's going to get a Ukraine he wants. He's not. We know that there are people in Moscow, including people who talk to Putin, who understand that Moscow's great adventure in Ukraine has not worked. And it's not going to work. So it's possible that once Poroshenko leaves, if he does leave, because he may well win, the Russians will take a second, much more serious look about making peace with Ukraine on terms that are acceptable. There are ideas out there, especially relating to peacekeeping, forces, which could provide a cover for a Kremlin exit. But I can tell you this, that the Kremlin will not win this war in Ukraine. They will have to make peace and on peace on terms that are largely acceptable to Ukraine and to Ukraine's Western backers, as long as Western policy remains at least as strong as it is today. But if the four of us have anything to say about it, it'll get stronger in the months ahead. 
Thank you very much. The second question is to Alexander Karchenko. Please get the microphone to him. And third question is to uh, Andrei Ilyarinov from Cato in the red tie. Alexander. Yep, right there. Thank you. Ukraine. Uh, first of all, thank you for this discussion in 24th anniversary of famous Budapest Memorandum. It's quite symbolic day today. And my question is about Nord Stream 2. You already mentioned it. What is more expensive for US and NATO? Uh, to stop installation of Nord Stream 2 in Baltic Sea or stop Russian military ships when they move to Baltic Sea to guard this pipe? Who wants to take that? Are you feeling daring? It's interesting question. Um, so I'll, I'll take a step. At, well, not the more expensive, because I think it was a rhetorical question. The prospect <laughs> of Russian military defense of uh, Nord, the, the pipelines in the Baltic Sea, um, you know, it, w it would be a significant new violation of international law. Uh, it would be in an area that NATO patrols and is much more present in. So I think that I would expect Russia to be much more cautious in the frog boiling operation, but I wouldn't rule it out. Um, I think that NATO has many more cards, and I mean, this may be something we come back to later, uh, many more cards in the deck. Playing, uh, Putin, here Putin has a really weak hand, not a, not a completely empty hand, because the Russian mil military is much stronger than it used to be and has assets and capabilities that it didn't used to and experience that it didn't used to. But uh, I wouldn't expect that to be, that wouldn't, that's not on the top of the list of my, of my top 10 worries of a, of a Russian military move that would put NATO in a bad place. But I agree with you that it can't be ruled out, um, and it would be worth thinking about how NATO or the United States or other European allies, uh, including Sweden and Finland, who aren't NATO members, uh, should respond early on to any kind of sign of Russia testing those, pardon, pardon the pun, testing the waters um, for that kind of operation. I know it's not entirely satisfactory, but um, that's yeah, maybe I got. Maybe when General Vigilov gets up here, he may have some, some views on this, but uh, I think it's a fairly implausible scenario. I mean, if Nord Stream 2 goes forward and is, you know, becomes operational, uh, it's presumably with the continued consent of the German government and uh, some other European states. So I don't see the Russians having the need to do that. I'm much more worried about some of their nefarious activities, uh, you know, cutting communications cables and generally uh, creating this uh, difficult environment for the reinforcement across the Atlantic for, for NATO, uh, you know, generally harassing shipping uh, as well as uh, you know, dangerous air operations in the, in the skies or in the Baltic Sea region. So that's one particular scenario that doesn't keep me up at night, but there's plenty of other ones to, uh, where we have to come up with more resources and a strategy to deal with. Uh, the Russians don't have unlimited resources either, but they're building faster than we are, uh, so we have to think ahead. Andre? Uh, three brief points. Uh, Celeste, may I suggest for expanding of your terminology, in addition to salami tactic and frog boiled, one more, boar constrictor <laughs> tactic. Uh, second point, uh, the unilateral annexation of Strait of Kerch is equally grave crime as it was uh, with annexation of Crimea in year 2014. This crime should not be left, must not be left without reaction from international community, as it was with reaction to annexation of Crimea. It is equally grave stories. Third, I would probably use this uh, audience and today's meetings for naming two small Ukrainian cities because towns. They may, might be in the center of international attention in coming weeks or days. Tavrysk and Kachovka. Those two little towns are allocated at the beginning of Severna Krymsky Canal that is supplying 85% of water for Crimea, actually supplied in year 2013. Um, this is a, might be the prime target of the military operations that, come, that can happen within really weeks or days. Uh, and it's probably one of the explanations of this concentration of troops in Crimea and in Sea of Azov, in Rostov and so on recently. 
Only today I saw at least five articles in the Russian media discussing critical importance of water supply from Dnieper for Crimea and necessity to establish security control of a canal and Kahovka uh, reservoir. One more, it's exactly what we have seen in year 2008 in summer about South Ossetia. Absolutely same approach. And last point, uh, General Kachov appeared in North Crimea. General Kachov, for those who are not uh, familiar with this person, is a person who was leading a hybrid operation in Abkhazia in South Ossetia in year 2008, mm -hmm. in Crimea in year 2014, and in Donbass mm -hmm. in year 2014. The appearance of him today in North Crimea is a very good, probably the strongest indicator about what is preparing for uh, southern part of Kherson Oblast and North Crimean Canal in coming weeks or maybe days. Thank you very much, Andre. I hope you'll write that up for the Ukraine Alert blog. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you to it. Um, I have a question right here from Rich Kramer. And uh, Go ahead. And then after that, Rich Kramer. Oleg Berkulov, VSTLV uh, Media Group from Riga, Latvia. Uh, I was uh, in September interviewing people in eastern Latvia, Rezek, Nedaugov, Pilkraslava. I could not find any people who felt any threat from Russia. They all wanted to cooperate with Russia. But the question is, uh, what, uh, uh, how will you compare the situation in eastern Latvia at this point in time with the situation uh, with uh, in the eastern Ukraine before Maidan in 2014, and also Great. thank you very much. No, thank Ambassador Hurst, I just want to compliment you on your knowledge of Russian language. I saw you on Russian talk show. Очень хороший русский язык. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who wants to take that question? Uh, I'll take it. Okay, go ahead, Ambassador Hurst. Oh, uh, and then right there behind him. There was far from serious support uh, or majority support in eastern Donbas for anything other than remaining part of Ukraine in 2014. The same is true, or not to the full extent, in Crimea. Ukrainian media conducted polls both in Crimea and in eastern Donbass in January of 2014. In the case of eastern Donbass, it showed 20, 25 percent maximum people might have been interested in becoming part of Russia. In Crimea, polls showed that at most 40, 42 percent were interested in either um, joining Russia or being um, independent from Ukraine. A majority in Crimea and a large majority in Donbass wanted the status quo. This is just one more, this is, this is the last good data we have regarding the attitudes of people in those places. Sure, just get ready for Rich Kramer right here. Go ahead. The other difference, and I know this isn't entirely comforting to those who care about Ukraine, but the other difference is Russia, I think the Kremlin is sensitive to costs and NATO membership matters. While I agree that I worry about the, the political temptation to meddle with Russian speakers and Russian populations in, Lat in Latvia and Estonia, um, I, I think the Kremlin is, is not crazy. And it does understand the importance of what NATO has done to reinforce capabilities to enhance uh, the deterrent message and the capabilities and the plans moving forward. And the American commitment, which I think is still solid, um, to the NATO alliance. And that really matters. Now, that doesn't solve the problem for Ukraine, because Ukraine is not a member of NATO. But there is something in there that is a lesson for Ukraine, which is the Kremlin is sensitive to costs. It is ambitious. It's annoying. It's difficult. But it is rational. And so there is a deterrence path that can be economic, political, and possibly military for Ukraine that will be effective, I think, That's in great, dealing with Russia. That's a great point. Thanks. Rich Kramer, please. Thank you, Melinda. Richard Kramer, Foreign Policy Research Institute. Um, we have a number of you know, experts and seasoned diplomats here, so I'm going to ask you to take off your Ukraine or Russian hats and put on something more broad, something more European. Um, Pew released a poll last week. 69% of Germans polled believe that they should have stronger relationship and cooperation with Russia versus the United States at 43%. A lot of our conversation today is focused on the importance of NATO and whether we're talking about sanctions or other retaliatory measures, the importance that Germany has in the alliance and in any long-term strategy we're going to have in order to deter continued Russian aggression. What counsel would you give to the administration, be it National Security Council, State Department officials, what have you, about what needs to happen? Because this is going to impact not simply Ukraine, but all of the lands between Berlin and Moscow. Thank you. Go ahead, please. I'm skeptical of reading too much into polls like that. The way I read that poll that you cited means Germans don't like the way Trump talks about Europe. And you know, I went through the Bush administration, you know, the Iraq war, you probably get 
I think there were similar polling results. All it meant was they were really mad at the current U.S. president's <coughs> policy. And even by the second term Bush, it was much better. And then we had Obama. And, and now we look back at, at that as the good old days. I'm not suggesting, I'm not sugarcoating the problems that this administration's reflexive anti-European rhetoric causes, particularly for Germany. You cannot, if you're an American pr administration, simultaneously want m German leadership and denigrate the instrument, the European Union, that allows Germany to exercise such leadership. Like, come on, man. Re World War II, remember? Um, I think that all of this is workable, OK? And um, even in this administration, uh, Secretary Pompeo did say good things about NATO. We next need to learn not to trash the EU for <laughs> political points. And I think that the Germans are also prepared to work with the, United, with the administration on dealing with this latest round of Russian aggression. I think they, they can separate the two. I'm being an optimist, but, but I, I believe what I said. We're going to take two questions at the front row. First is Oksana, and then this gentleman here. Thank you very much, Belinda. I do have a question, although it's really hard to question and contest uh, such wonderful speakers, and everything that have been said today is uh, very much in line with the official position of Ukraine. Um, Just remind although, me where, uh, where you're from. Um, I'm Oksana Shulyar, uh, Deputy Chief of Mission of Ukraine. Thank you. Um, the, the, the only thing that uh, I've humbly found missing was the mentioning of the Budapest Memorandum, because this short video clip that we've all seen, this is, by the way, the first uh, aggression that happened, uh, so the ramming, which was filmed later in the evening, there was also shooting. So uh, these were first recorded um, evidences of, of the Russian aggression, of the Russian military aggression against the Ukrainian military. And um, Ukraine, uh, recently we, um, we addressed um, our partners on uh, our sides of the Budapest Memorandum to call the consultations and uh, to, 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 to sort of invoke this mechanism. How would you see the, um, um, how would you see the, the ability and still uh, how, uh, what does the Budapest Memorandum means when we talk about the international law, when we talk about the architecture of uh, security and defense, when we see some, you know, the, 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 the cornerstone uh, treaties um, <laughs> questioned and uh, challenged? What is, what is your perspective? Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to take Budapest? Sandy? Dan? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a tough question to answer because ob obviously the Buddhist Pest Memorandum uh, was meant to guarantee Ukraine's sovereignty, its territorial integrity, and, and it failed. And it lacked any enforcement mechanism, uh, but it also is a reality that the other signatories lacked the resolve and the political will at the time to kind of try to uphold its principles. And once it was gone, I don't know whether we can bring it back as a mechanism for managing today's crises, certainly not while the Russians are you know, in occupation of uh, vast parts of Ukrainian territory. Uh, I think we have to think about it more broadly as sort of the goal is to get Russia back into compliance with principles <coughs> that are reflected in the Budapest Memorandum, uh, which itself is going to take a long time. But Donbass may be the place where you could hope to begin a process of bringing Russia back into compliance with the law. Uh, that seems very distant right now. Russia's stonewalling on, on, the, on the Donbass and clearly trying to establish new facts on the ground, whether it's the declaratory reinterpretation of the 2003 agreement to, to effectively annex the Kerch Strait, uh, or what they might do in the coming months to further uh, dramatize Ukraine's you know, uh, incapacity to govern itself uh, to, in order to influence the elections. So. Uh, uh, we all just have to draw the lessons from our failure to, to, to stand up for the Budapest Memorandum when we could have, uh, but I think look to the future to the more general challenge of Russian compliance with international law. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question. This gentleman right here, please. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, Sisyphus <laughs> and the Pueblo seizure in January 68. Uh, when the Lyndon Johnson administration that was so enmeshed in Vietnam could do nothing. Um, from Putin's perspective, whether it's a war strong or weak hand, he's on a roll. He takes a look at Western leadership. Merkel is a lame duck. 
Macron is dealing with yellow jackets and may fail. Uh, Theresa maybe I think is gone or will be gone after the 11th. And uh, Donald Trump is running out of feet in which to shoot himself given the smoking saw and the tariff ban comments and Bob Mueller. So from Putin's perspective, it seems to me he's dealing with an extremely weakened leadership. And so to focus on Ukraine, you come up with a lot of good ideas. I have a number such as why don't we think about at least raising the prospect of a new Montreux Convention, which would drive the Turks crazy. Uh, Tomahawk missiles to the Romanian Navy, if they could accommodate them, is not a bad idea. But it strikes me that what we need is a much broader view, which has got to be a Putin talk, hopefully with somebody on this side, which would have to be Trump, but which puts it in a broader strategic concept. You've got INF coming apart. The Russians want they can just destroy us with what they can do with more nuclear weapons that they have and we don't. You've got START II or New START. And so my point here or my question is, would it not be a bad idea to see, given the, even the weakness on this side, if there's some way of having an overarching conference between Putin and Trump that might address all these issues within a context? Because otherwise, I really don't see anything happening over Ukraine, and I see the Russians becoming, if not more aggressive, probably smart in what they're doing to advance their policies. Thank you very much. So let's go ahead. I unfortunately have to run out of the room, so I'm going to do a really evil thing and say something quickly and run, but I'll be back. Um, a conference right now would be a disaster because Putin's not feeling the pain yet. And so I would come back to Dan's, uh, and I would expand. I, would, I want to highlight one point Dan made especially, is that there are a zillion sanctions you could put on Russia. But what you want to put on the Kremlin are effective sanctions that matter to the leadership. And there was a possible set of such sanctions that were considered last year by this administration and which were put to the side. And it was exactly those people who really matter to the core leadership. And so re-looking at those kinds of sanctions, looking at taking some of the actions, first you talk about reinforcing military capabilities of NATO members that are not destabilizing, but reinforce capabilities in a responsible way. All of those options I would do first. I wouldn't go right, he, what Putin would love right now is a European security conference between him and President Trump, because he is on a roll. And you need to stop the roll first and then sit down once the balance of costs that uh, the Kremlin is experiencing are more to favor of seriously getting back <coughs> to the original principles uh, that Russia signed up to. I mean, we're not asking Russia to uh, sign up to anything that it, hasn't, it didn't accept at the end of the Cold War, that actually doesn't protect the Russian Federation, which itself, you know, used to belong to other countries. Parts of it used to belong to other countries. So I, I agree that at some point you're going to need to sit down with the, with the Kremlin, but not, not right now. It would be a, a significant mistake. Thank you so much, Celeste. I'm afraid Sorry. we're out of time. I know that there are oh, many questions. See, that was really rude. Please put your <laughs> hands together and, and help me uh, thank this extraordinary panel. Okay, here's what we're going to do next. Don't move yet. Don't move yet. You're moving. Freeze, freeze. Our gentlemen are going to go uh, grab their seats. We're going to change the stage, and then we're going to be joined by General Breedlove. So we need one minute to reset the stage. Please don't, don't go anywhere. Thank you very much.
time. Have a seat, please. <clears throat> Thanks very much for your patience. It's now my pleasure to welcome a great friend of the Atlantic Council, General Philip M. Breedlove. General, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much for being with us. Okay, so first of all, thank you to the team for having me and for inviting me back. Uh, thank you to the panel before. Um, Ambassador, I beg to differ. You weren't last. I was last. Almost all the good things have already been said, so I will just add maybe some remarks that might roll a grenade out on the table and see what happens next in the questions and answers. Uh, and it is pretty tough to follow uh, four people who I would consider my professors or mentors on many of these subjects. So we'll see how this goes. So I will start by asking all of us collectively a question. And that question is, are we surprised at all by what happened in the Strait? Are we surprised at all? I agree uh, completely with the fact that this is just the next step. And I, I had my talking point taken away from me in that it started with the inspections of the ships. And we see this as just the next iteration of how this pressure is being surprised or being brought against us. As we reflect back on Georgia, Crimea, Donbass, Syria, I don't think we should be surprised. And frankly, I agree with our learned colleagues from before. This is not the last expected step. There will be more. Did we, and as I talk about we, I would like for you to think of that as the West. As you remember, uh, I was all about being in an alliance, and I am a firm believer in the value of our great alliance, and I want to talk always in the context of our allies and working with our allies. So did we, the West, react appropriately to the invasion of Crimea? Did we, the West, react appropriately, appropriately to the invasion of the Donbass and the support given to those in the Donbass? And, and not mentioned very much today, did we react appropriately to the shootdown of MH17? and all of the lives that were lost there. Twice, the Russian Federation used military force to once again change internationally recognized borders in the European landmass. And what was our response? On MH17, we knew within hours, maybe dozens of hours is the right way to say it, but we knew within hours exactly what happened. And yet, how long did it take us as the West to call this to task and to roll out in a definitive way what happened? A couple of days over two years. And after that, and the fact that the, the pot had stopped boiling and the, the definitive answers were rolled out, what happened? Has anyone been held to task? Has anyone been brought accountable for the loss of MH17? We missed our opportunity, I believe, in all three cases to take action when action would have had more appropriate response. We took too long to even put out a real definitive, um, de uh, a real definitive statement on Crimea because we were arguing amongst ourselves who the little, br the little green men were. We still, I don't think, have put out clear, alliance-wide, definitive remarks about what we saw and continue to see in the Donbass. We seem to have accepted it as the new norm. And once again, no one has really held anyone accountable for a lot of lives lost in the shootdown of the airliner. So what has our response been so far? And I'm going to sound very critical. Um, I don't mean to be overly critical, but I want to grade this like I would as if I was a fighter pilot grading the performance of my airmen in an air-to-air -air engagement where lives are at stake. We don't pull punches. Minsk, I ask you, is Minsk working? Is Minsk working? I don't see anybody shaking their head north and south. <laughs> Minsk is not working. Neither side is moving. 
And frankly, we sort of, we now, the we being the United States, we sort of threw the action over the transom to our French and German allies to take care of it, and we really stepped back away from Minsk. I don't think Minsk is working. We have yet, either as the United States or as the West, to have engaged Russia in their information war and their cyber war below the lines. They continue to bring this disinformation war, as I call it, on Kyiv, on the legitimacy of the government, on what the government's trying to do for its people. They begin and uh, continue to bring these pressures, like in the Kerch Strait, to say that this government cannot protect the people, cannot take care of what the people need, and frankly, because they're so distracted with what's going on on the line of contact, they can't really get to the reform that the Maidan demanded of them. And so the, the impetus in the beginning is not being met and could be that spark that causes the problems we talked about that could happen in the next election. What did we do on the military side? I remember the first reply. We sent brave, brave MREs to be eaten <laughs> by our Ukrainian troops. So I am being harsh now. But I would, off, I would offer that there was much more that we could have done on the military side. We eventually got to sending some, some counter-mortar radars, although limited in their software applications, et cetera, et cetera. So there were things to do. But again, the timing and the debate before we took these actions really watered down the effect of what we did for Ukraine. What we did do is what we always do when we have issues with Russia. And that is in all respect to, I call the ambassador my professor occasionally, what we did was sanctions. That's how we deal with Russia. We don't do really strong diplomatic measures. We don't do any informational measures. We do very, very weak military measures so that we don't provoke or accelerate the problem. And we hit them with sanctions. That's what we always do. So I would offer to you that my uh, overview of our response to any of these actions, be it Crimea, the Donbass, or to the shoot down of MH17, is we have re responded in a very siloed way in the economic sphere with san sanctions, and we have not taken those broader diplomatic, informational, and military steps that we might should have taken. So it might then jump out to you what I would suggest that we do do. First, I think that we have to decide publicly that we have to confront these actions. If we do not confront these actions, why would we expect them to change? It just is not logical to follow. Second, we need to realize that these sanctions alone will not they have not changed Russian behavior. And then third, I would say, as Americans, we need to reinsert ourselves into the thought and action leadership positions in these kind of matters. Um, right, wrong, or indifferent, I pass no judgment on any uh, p particular political position or whatever, but what I would observe, having been the commander of UCOM and, and the SACIR for NATO, is that when the U.S. stepped back from these roles, it didn't work well for us. Finally, I think we need to determine, again publicly, to answer these challenges in an all-of-government fashion. We need to work with allies, work with other leaders among the allies, lead some allies to reassert diplomatic pressure on Russia to clearly show broad support to ending their rash and dangerous behavior. This is not the time for mincing of terms. It's time for very clear language amongst us and our allies. We need to refute in no uncertain terms the Russian narrative on Crimea and on the Donbass. We need to aggressively answer 
and refute the disinformation campaign and what I call war below the lines in both cyberspace and infospace. We don't need to lie. We don't need to lie to our people. We don't need to disinform if we simply aggressively told the truths that we know about these situations. And if we brought our allies along with us to aggressively en masse tell the truths, that's enough for a start. We need to take the next steps to make Ukraine, and as was wonderfully suggested, some of our allies around Ukraine more militarily viable. It's not my word, but I really like it. A good friend of mine said, we need to make Ukraine the kind of porcupine that Russia can't swallow. <laughs> we need to sharpen the tools and capabilities of the Ukrainians so that Russia sees it as too expensive. Celeste was very clear about cost, and I would have added to that deaths of their soldiers. These are things that Russia has had to worry about in the not too distant past, and we need to make Ukraine a porcupine. Uh, I happen to believe that every nation has a right to defend itself. Additionally, in military measures, before I became the UCOM commander and during the time that I was the UCOM commander, the UCOM staff in a US bilateral sense with the Ukrainian military did extensive studies on how to more professionalize, improve, and adapt the Ukrainian military forces. So we don't need to be hugely creative. There's already been a lot of very in-depth wonderful staff work done that can be fallen back on now to look at those things that we could do to adapt and help Ukraine to be that porcupine. We need to address the growing A2AD, anti-access area denial capability of the Crimea. If you believe the pictures in the paper the last two days, we see now see pictures of S-400 emplacements on Crimea. That's a problem. That's a problem for all manner of aircraft traveling through that airspace. We need to address the clear naval shortfalls that allows Russia to use the bullying tactics that they have used in the Straits. Uh, there were so many good uh, suggestions made by the panel of, of absolute one eaches that, that we could do in these manner. I'm not going to repeat all of those. Maybe a few that are a little bit more incendiary that maybe I'm not suggesting but I believe should be considered. Long range precise fires. Can NATO or can the Ukraine hold precise targets at risk in the Donbass in Crimea? Coastal defense cruise missiles. It would be decades possibly before the Ukrainian Navy could challenge the Russian Navy in these waters. But certainly a capability to strike with lethality and with precision from store would give the Russian Federation pause. We should find and support continued and more targeted sanctions. I love the words that were used up here. I even, shop, I even sharpened them one more level. I believe Russia is a kleptocracy run by kleptocrats. And we need to be clearly targeting these kleptocrats and their money abroad wherever it is. When we bring pressure, as was mentioned by three of the panelists, on that group right around Mr. Putin, I think that is an, an appropriate next step. So I hope that's enough grenades rolled out on the table. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here. And I will do my very best to answer the questions, the hard questions, especially as they relate to politics. I'm going to defer to the two ambassadors who were not smart enough to depart the fix after they got, got up here. OK? General. Why don't you have a, you have a mic? Sure. Why don't you have a seat? All right. Um, I will take the privilege of the first question, and then we'll let the audience get their questions in. Uh, you mentioned uh, coastal defense cruise missiles. Uh, do you have any particular missiles in mind? I, I tell you what, I wouldn't want to go there, because uh, I think that 
as I said before, first of all, this is a pretty big step. Right. And this is not a step that I would uh, take unilaterally as the United States. This is something that I would want our NATO allies to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's an allied system, maybe it's a US system. I, I realize tomahawks were brought up before and other mm -hmm. things. There are some specific things to consider, but I think that, that we have to raise the stakes for this kind of aggressive behavior. And this is one of the things that should be considered. Okay, and actually one, one more question. Um, Sandy mentioned the importance of increasing the NATO naval presence in the Black Sea. Uh, would you endorse that as a way of suggesting to the Russians they've created an additional strategic problem for themselves by their latest aggression? So uh, I did endorse that when I was the commander because as you know, we stepped up the presence right. of the destroyers out of Rota in the Black Sea. And I think that it's important that, it, that uh, it's not just the United States. We have very capable allies and frankly, some very capable partners who might also come alongside of us. But I think it is important for NATO to say that the Black Sea is an open body of water. Romania is very clear-eyed. We need to help some of the others in the Black Sea, literal. Okay, questions right here. And please identify yourself. No, you're first. Go. Uh, thank you. you need a microphone. Thank you. Sergei Mishirak, former diplomat and the head of economic security in Council of National Security and Defense on Ukraine. Uh, the topic of uh, this event is very precisely reflects what is going on. And in this context, I would like to propose to consider the proposition in the first page of the website of the Atlantic Council to change the subtitle of section a Russian-Ukrainian conflict, Russian aggression against Ukraine, or war of aggression against Ukraine. I think it will be more precise, reflects uh, the situation, which is what is going on now, and the, uh, it will act also to the notion of aggression of the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, so if we're speaking about the political and legal instruments, uh, international organizations are not used enough uh, to, uh, uh, to enhance what they already could do. What do I mean? For example, the maritime uh, International Maritime Organization. The, uh, there is also the uh, Montreal Convention, which is multinational, multilateral uh, treaty. Uh, there is Danube Convention, and in all these spheres, uh, a lot of stuff have have to be done. Just and there is the possibility to exclude Russian from different governed borders of this organization or the organization itself, because. In most of uh, this organization, a lot of countries, majority of country, is just the uh, member of ally, a member of NATO and member of European Union. Question, so my please. question is: Yes, yes uh, what uh, do you think have to be done by Russia uh, for everybody to understand the necessity to ch to create anti-Russia coalition, or at least the task force? Uh, which could deal with the Ukrainian problem and which could proactively uh, act to the Russian aggression. Thank you very much. So, uh, not, not criticizing, but after all that, I think what you asked me is what is, the, what is the next step that Russia would have to take in order for us to respond with a task force? I, I can't define that. Uh, I, I, I don't think I would even want to try to define that. Um, I, I think that back to what you said before, much agreement with a couple of things you said. One, there are a lot of agreements out there. If we simply made efforts to hold Russia accountable to all of those agreements, that would be a good first step, wouldn't it? Um, and so um, I think that's a, a first start. Uh, secondarily, what I learned very quickly as the SACUR was that I could not speak for the 28 nations when I was there, it was only 28. So I couldn't speak for them but I could try to lead them in their military options. And so I would offer that I'm sure the, the SACUR is ready to answer your question if he's ever here in front of you, the current one. Okay, question over here, Holland. Uh, 
I'm Harlan Owen. My question is both to you, John, and to you, Phil. Uh, regarding increased NATO deployments in the Black Sea, as you know, the Montreux Convention limits you to 21 days in relatively small ships. And quite frankly, Romania has not made, in my judgment, the changes that it needs. And with its new defense minister, the chances are slim to none. So we've got to look at other things. I'm pessimistic to think that this administration is going to take any of the steps that you suggest, at least the White House. The only opening I can think that might be useful, as you know, in the national defense strategy, the mission is to deter and, if necessary, defeat, among other countries, Russia. And so perhaps one might want to think of encouraging Jim Mattis and Joe Dunford at least to examine the question, how are we going to deter Russia specifically in the Black Sea? And to get from really the only really competent branch of government right now, I'm sad to say in this administration, some ideas that may be useful in helping to shape debate, because I think we're wasting our time with this White House. But I'd like to get your views on that. You want to go first, Mr. Ambassador? I'll follow your lead. If you want me to go first, I'll go first. So, so I, I agree with the premise of what you're saying about we, we need to understand what it would take to deter Russia in the Black Sea. Um, and, uh, and while many are hoping I'm about to say something terribly military, I believe it starts with something that Sandy actually said before, and that is that we have to do this as an alliance with our other allies, with the, with the agreed, not just consent, of, but participation of everyone else. We can't be seen, I think, as going in there U.S. unilaterally on a, on a matter like this. I think that would actually play into Mr. Putin's hands. So this would start first by building that alliance, even if it's a mini coalition of the willing inside the alliance, to show the NATO flag more aggressively uh, in, in the sea. And I mean, at the extreme other end, the Russians have been harassing Ukrainian boats. Maybe we harass Russian boats. I don't know. These are pretty extraordinary measures. But the clear message we have to send is this is not your backyard and you don't drive the train here alone. I would simply add to that that while I understand, Harlan, your skepticism about the White House, what we've seen with this administration is that the policies that have evolved, and I use that word deliberately evolved, um, through serious um, thinking by defense, state, and the NSC, whatever reservations may originally be in the White House are, seem to evaporate. And the policies have turned out to be pretty good. So the notion of DOD developing these policies along these lines is quite, quite plausible. And I agree that we want to do this in a NATO context. And while the whole alliance might be a little bit skeptical, I think there are partners who'd be happy to join in this. I'm thinking particularly of the Canadians mm -hmm. and the Balts and the Poles. Uh, anyway, okay. This next question um, over here, and then we'll come over here. R.L. Cohen, the Atlantic Council. Um, General, uh, two questions, in fact. Uh, about the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. First, in your experience as a uh, soccer, how would you craft policy towards Turkey? Because Turkey is absolutely important here as a Black Sea maritime power, and uh, it actually does have experience in, I won't say harassing, but behaving assertively vis-a-vis -vis our other NATO uh, ally, Greece. But the second question is, what can be done now, to the extent you want to discuss and disclose, uh, in terms of the area of the canal and the uh, Kachovka uh, reservoir? Because it's a big reservoir. Uh, can you reinforce there? What, what would you recommend? Thank you. So, so uh, again, let me sort of agree with the first premise, and, and I would do it much more broadly. Turkey is incredibly important to whatever answer is crafted here. And I like the suggestion before to begin to have conversations about re-looking at the Montreux Convention. Um, I'm not sure that Turkey would sign up to that, frankly. But the, but, but the fact of the matter is that if we could have continued bad behavior in the Black Sea, then we might need to rethink who comes and goes from the Black Sea and with what freedoms and for what reasons. 
and Turkey would be the critical ally in that respect. Um, the, uh, um, the Kerch Bridge area, as was said earlier, I learned this word, I'm an aviator, but I learned a naval word. The hydrography of the <laughs> Kerch Strait is an incredibly interesting one and could, could be used by either the Russians or others to cause problems in that area. So that is not off the table, I think. But you bring up the other end of the water of the Black Seas, and um, there are many, many ways to be more defensible and aggressive there. I'm not going to wander off into what ifs or hows, but I would just leave where I started. The critical step here is to work with Turkey not craft policy at them or whatever, but to work with truck, Turkey to find ourselves in a better and more, re more responsible alliance position as it regards to the Montreux Convention. Okay, next question. I think there's one over here. I think we need a second microphone. Hi, Ben Schmidt, State Department. I just wanted to ask, in, in the, the wake of this attack on Ukrainian vessels, German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas said that there was no connection between Nord Stream 2 and the situation in the Sea of Azov. That is in spite of the fact that the Ukrainian gas transmission system with which the Russian Federation relies on to get gas to Europe, if one, one overlays the line of contact map with that pipeline map, in many cases directly is the perimeter of the line of contact, sometimes in the case of a few kilometers. So the question is, if, if absent of, of, of sanctions, as Ambassador Freed has said, what does the United States government or maybe the United States mili military do to convince the Germans that there is this direct military hard security element uh, to protecting Ukraine of stopping Nord Stream 2 immediately? I am going to let the ambassador answer 90% of that one because it's more about the U.S. government, I think, than the military. But here's what I, I have said many times before. In fact, I think I've said it from this stage, that when the Russian Federation used their all-of-government approach to bring pressure on Ukraine and then to bring pressure on the rest of Europe to not respond to their transgressions in Ukraine, pricing, recall of loans, and shutting off energy was one of the first tools they used. And so it did have a military impact by dissolving or, or diffusing the response in the fear of those nations who are absolutely dependent on Russia for their energy facing those tools that Russia used. And so it is a tool that has military impact. The rest, sir, I'll let you take. Um, first, uh, I would say with the exception of Helmut Schmidt, um, one does not look to the SPD for geostrategic insight. <laughs> uh, and his statement, I think, is all about protecting Nord Stream 2, a project which we understand, and for that matter, increasingly, even in Germany, at least on the part of the CDU understands, is a geopolitical project against Western interests and not a, an economic project. As we all know, um, what was it? Sberbank, the Russian bank, put a report on its website um, not too long ago, which said this is not even in Russia's economic interest. It's in the interest of politically connected people. So this is clearly a geopolitical project which will enrich folks who are friendly with the president of Russia. Uh, so we're not going to persuade the SPD that Nord Stream 2 is a bad idea. Um, my understanding is the Trump administration is taking a very hard look at, at Nord Stream 2. And I think we're seeing all sorts of signs that Nord Stream 2 will not be realized. But this is not a sure thing. OK, let's see. Uh, over here, we have two. And then we'll get you. Hi, my name is Bob Homans with uh, Perio Associates. Um, apparently, today, Ukraine tested a 300-kilometer anti-ship missile. It, it was on uh, Turchinov's uh, Twitter feed. Um, Identify Turchina for the crowd, please. He is the head of the National Defense Council, I think. The National Security and Security. Defense Council. Okay. Um, how capable do you think this missile is? And um, 
are, do you agree with the possibility of incorporating Western technology either into the missile or associated radar and guidance systems to ensure that they hit what they were shooting at? Thank you. So I, <laughs> so I haven't read this tweet or this report, so I don't know what's in the public sector, and I, I just can't comment on what I do know beyond that. So uh, I just won't. Um, but I told you that in my remarks, I, I am not personally endorsing that we supply a coastal defense cruise missile to Ukraine, but I do endorse that we have that conversation with our allies. And uh, we have capabilities out there. If they're building their own, this may all be moot uh, pretty soon. But I do believe that we, as I said, stealing the words from a friend, we need to look at all manner of options of making Ukraine a much more prickly porcupine for Russia to swallow. Okay, question right behind over there. Osman, uh, Turkey clearly is a very key player in the situation. However, aren't Russian-Turkish relations on a steady improvement as we speak? Uh, I think that Russian-Turkish relations are an extremely interesting and important subject, but I think your characterization is not quite right for the following reason. Uh, a major development, uh, and I referred to this earlier, uh, in Ukraine's independence was the decision by the Patriarch of Constantinople, AKA Istanbul, to agree to issue a tomos of, auto of autocephaly to the Ukrainian church. Now, as recently as, as April, I was skeptical this would happen because I know that Erdogan could prevent it. And I didn't think he was going to say no to Putin. And I know that Putin, it's known that Putin raised this with him. But he did. So I don't rule out the possibility of Turkey taking steps on other issues which don't suit the Kremlin. But I'm not predicting it either. It's, it's just it's a thing you watch and see how it plays out. OK, now a question over here and then over here. Thank you very much, Voice of America, Russian Service. Um, General, uh, my friend and uh, prom prominent Russian military analyst, Paul Felgengar, probably you met him and you know him. Uh, when we met in Prague last week, he said that after Nord Stream 2 build, nothing, virtually nothing, prevents Russian generals to go with open war to Ukraine because there is another way of gas supply for Europe. The uh, Kremlin doesn't need Ukraine anymore. Do you agree with that? And do you agree with uh, still the possibility of big war uh, or big invasion of Russia to Ukraine? And second question, you actually strike very emotional thing in me. I mean, I mean about MH17. I remember myself uh, being ashamed to speak Russian in Europe after that. And I'm Russian. What do you think uh, West, Western response should be at that time? And what would be a proper response? Thank you. So I, I will not satisfy on Nord Stream. I, I think that the things that impede Russia from attacking Ukraine go beyond Nord Stream. I mean, there were some wonderful things discussed mm -hmm. here earlier. It would be a huge step. It would be a costly step. I do also believe that that uh, Mr. Putin has done more damage for himself and the Russian people inside of Ukraine than even he understands. And so I think there are many other impediments. I, I, don't, I don't place nearly as much emphasis on Nord Stream as the collective here apparently does. I go back to the answer I gave before. I think that uh, it, we don't have to go very far back in history in the less than the last five years to understand how Russia uses energy supplies, energy, energy dynamics, pricing, etc., as a weapon. And my uh, suggestion to nations in Europe is don't put the, own, put the weapon to your own head. Um, remind me the second one, I'm sorry. MH17. Yeah, MH17. So first and foremost, we should have done something right then as I said, it's my assertion, uh, without uh, going beyond where we can talk, I can't 
offer you any great proof, but it's my assertion that we knew within a day or so exactly what happened. And we should have struck when the iron was hot. And we should have built that international coalition. Now it's bigger than NATO. It's nations outside of NATO, Indonesia, and Malaysia, and others. And so we should have assembled that coalition to very, very publicly bring sanctions and pressures and talk the military option right now rather than waiting months and allowing the, situ the situation to diffuse. Um, and so I think more than anything, when you ask me what should we have done, maybe it's some of the things we eventually did with counter mortar radars and all these other things, but we should have done it right now. The delay hurt our response. I think we should look at what we're doing now about this instance and determine will the delay dilute the, the response, whatever it is when there is one. Good afternoon, Ambassador uh, General. Um, this, these questions have elements both military and, and diplomatic. By its actions in um, the Kerch Strait uh, against Ukrainian vessels, not just the military vessels, but for months and months impeding um, merchant um, vessels, has Russia effectively actually torn up the bilateral treaty of 2003, uh, and therefore, um, if Ukraine wants to invite NATO vessels into the ports of Berdyansk and Mariupol, um, does it have the right to do so? The second question is that last week, Ukraine was cautioned to show um, restraint, uh, not to overreact, and um, uh, there was a lot of discussion about how such a reaction by Ukraine might be the very pretext that Putin was looking for um, to launch a, a broader um, assault. But um, in the end, too much restraint uh, is beginning to look to many Ukrainians as almost surrender. So if Ukraine had um, the capacity to do so and actually struck at um, a Russian naval <coughs> vessel with a missile, what do you think would be the Western reaction and NATO's reaction? So uh, I think you mentioned the treaty in 2003. I, I, there are several treaties that Russia has abrogated when it comes to, to um, Ukraine. Uh, they were a signatory to protecting the sovereign boundaries of Ukraine. And they changed those sovereign boundaries by force. Uh, I think that you have it exactly right. The harassment of the merchants and certainly the military actions taken more recently have abrogated the, the agreement of 2003. So uh, I don't think there's much to discuss there. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the question you pose is, is a very good one. Um, I, I take a tiny offense, and I said it to my good friend Harlan Ullman twice. I take a tiny offense to how people categorize this, that this is the first time that Russians have taken you know, this overt action against Ukrainian soldiers. I think that happened immediately in Crimea. We knew who the little green men were. They denied it, denied it, and denied it right up until Mr. Putin said, oh yeah, they are ours, but they're all there on vacation, so it's okay. You know, this is not the first time that <coughs> Russian soldiers, sailors, or Marines have taken overt action against Ukraine. And so um, it, it's an interesting question that you ask, though, how would NATO respond if Ukraine respond? What I do agree with, and I'm not being rough on those who said it, this is the most overt, unclassified, on TV example of the Russians attacking directly the Ukrainians with their military. And that might have been a big difference if there had been a reaction. I do not know. I don't think anybody in Europe, and I can tell you when I was the commander, nobody on our side of the fence wants a war with Russia. I really don't think Russia wants a war with us either, frankly. Um, but I, uh, and because of that, 
I don't think any of us want that hair trigger response that kicks off something cataclysmic, very kinetic, et cetera, et cetera. But I feel like I'm speaking out the other side of my mouth right now when I say what I said earlier. I believe that every country has the right to defend itself. The Ukrainian ships were fired on. They were rammed. They would have, in my thought, had the right to respond. Other questions? All the way in the back, on the right. Uh, thank you, Anna Kendros. I'm working with Ambassador John Herbst at Georgetown's Uni U Georgetown University's um, Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. So I actually have more of a diplomatic and development question, if that's okay, concerning the Donbass, um, especially the non-government controlled territories. So I know the conflict is, of course, still very active, especially in the last few weeks. So, But I'm wondering, beyond Minsk, is there any sort of social, economic, or political reintegration f strategy for the Donbass and the Ukrainians who still live there? And um, besides a signal to the international community and territorial integrity and the importance around that, what exactly are we working toward when it comes to kind of beyond military signals and how do we get there? Okay, so please don't take this as a personal offense. You use some words, non-governmental controlled territories. I assume you're talking about the Russian and separatist occupied lands in Ukraine. I, I, would, I would never use non-government controlled territories because that seems <coughs> to give some legitimacy to what's going on there. These are lands that are occupied by separatists supported by Russians. Military force used to change an internationally recognized border. And the Minsk agreement has set as its goal to reestablish that border and to get those occupying and supporting forces out of Donbass. So please don't be angry with me, but I don't like, I, ne I haven't heard those words and I wrote them down immediately when you said them. I will never say them again, except for <laughs> to criticize them. <laughs> um, so I, I think what we said before is we have to take this on. I don't think Minsk is working. So should we begin to relook at Minsk? Should more members of the West, and I would tell you my vote would be yes and one of them would be the United States, should they become involved in reestablishing a process that might work? Because right now, neither side, please forgive, but I don't think the Ukrainians nor the Russians are making a huge effort towards accomplishing mints because it would be political suicide for one side and it would be just out of the question for the other side that they would take any action until the Ukrainians accomplished everything asked of them. And so frankly, uh, I'm being a bit uh, critical here of this, but I don't think Minsk is working for us. So the starting point is either to begin to build a coalition that's willing to say it's Minsk and that means the border and we're going to address this in the larger context of the European Union and NATO, or we need to relook at uh, uh, a different agreement that Minsk that would have the effect that we all want, which is to reestablish the political border of Ukraine that was recognized by the entire world before the conflict. Well, I think we're out of questions and maybe out of time. So thank you very much, General Breedlove. You're wonderful. <laughs>